of them means all of them. That is the slogan that protesters have been chanting since the beginning of the revolution that started on October the 17th, calling for the fall of the entire government. You in particular have borne the brunt of a lot of the criticism from some protesters. Why do you think they've singled you out? You know, the protesters are really righteous about their demands. Uh, not only I sympathize with them, I couldn't bear the situation, the economical situation in, in Lebanon at the level of corruption. And the killon, yani killon, everybody means everybody, is a kind of frustration they are expressing, though it's unfair to someone like me, for example. It shows somehow where people cannot bear anything, anybody, because of the failure of the system. Uh, that's how I can uh, analyze it. But uh, I can say that this slogan also somehow would be protecting people from accountability. Because if everybody is corrupt, then you cannot make anybody accountable. But do you agree that you are seen as part of the political establishment and protesters are fed up with the political establishment? Yes, of course. Whether they are right or wrong, this is the perception. And we are paying the price of 30 years of wrong policies and of corruption. Being in power in the last three years as such, the, the country on the verge of collapsing. So we are paying the price of the mistakes of others. So are you saying that they're wrong to single you out? Of course they are. Why but is that? This, you know, truth Some of them say you're the, the, you're the son-in-law of the president. This is the third ministerial post that you hold. You previously served as Minister of Telecommunications, Minister of Water and Energy, without initially even holding a parliamentary seat. So some point and say, well, this is exactly what's wrong with the system in Lebanon. You know, truth will prevail at the end, but this is not the issue now. Uh, my person is minor in what the country is facing. Now, the, uh, the priority is to save the country. Okay. And the way to save it is well known. It's through following a path of reforms, fighting corruption, and really putting the country on the way on, on its path of uh, stability is already there. We need now prosperity. And the, our economy has all the ingredients to rise up again. So this is the priority now. Uh, and later on, as I told you, justice will, will prevail. Uh, truth will be apparent to everybody. Let's discuss what will happen this week. Since we have you with us, uh, you can give us some news. So consultations between the president and the parliamentary blocs to name a new prime minister expected on Monday. They've been delayed in the past uh, over disagreements over naming a new prime minister. It seems like these disagreements still remain, though. So what's different this time around? You know, we have our political disagreements. That's why, in order to cope with the requests of the demonstrators and at the same time not to get out of the Constitution, we are advocating for forming a government of specialists backed by the politicians, by the parliament, which is our Constitution, that can be able to uh, implement the reforms that are needed and that, that are already agreed on. We now only need to execute that plan of reforms, the budget, the electricity, the solid waste, so much to do in a very short period of time. And mainly, we have to correct the wrong policies in finance and, and monetary. So uh, the roadmap is there. It's well known. We need to implement it. And I guess we have, for this purpose, to get away of our political differences and be up to the aspirations of our people. You recently said that you and the party, the free patriotic movement of which you are the head, uh, will back a new government, as you're saying, made up of entirely technocrats, but not with the caretaker Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri at its head. No. Why have you taken the stance? Or clarify your statement. No, it is, it is, these are some Lebanese details, but it is technocrats and specialists and back, the, there are quite, many differences on this. But the idea is not to have the same repetition of governments who failed before. I believe we should give a chance for a, for a kind of a change. And this is what I meant by, by, by not having the ex-Prime Minister Hariri in, uh, in place. Or we don't mind, then we will be out 
and we facilitate the formation of such a government. What is important now is to have an efficient government who will succeed. You know, uh, this is the priority. So and the political differences will be resolved later on. So if Saad al-Hariri then is named this week on Monday, you will not be participating in the government, to be True. clear. Clear. So what terms then, or are you leaving the door open to, um, to you, for your party to participate on, on different terms? And if so, what are they? No, it's fine. If we stay out of the government, it's not the end of the country, you know. We would be having a kind of uh, constructive opposition uh, and to help her where our help is needed. And as I told you, now we can sacrifice this to help the country. And this is the priority, and I think this is the only thing needed for Lebanon. A government that can produce, that can really make the results, and if we are seen not to really be uh, part of it, then we don't mind. We are ready for the sacrifice, though we are the majority bloc in the parliament, and uh, we have our constitutional right to be there, but we can sacrifice this. Uh, speaking of I the bloc, you know, yes, go ahead. Getting above these details of Lebanon. Lebanon is a country that is worth to survive. It is a model of diversity, pluralism, and tolerance that is worth to preserve. And we need Lebanon to be on his feet again, to be that model of uh, coexistence. Because if Lebanon vanishes, I can only see extremism and terrorism in our region. So this is worth fighting for. True, and that's what the protesters say as well. Lebanon is worth exactly. fighting for, but what they're looking for is for uh, sort of concrete action that the ruling elite, the powers that be, are willing to give up power, are willing to make major concessions to give up power and give up those seats that have been rotating amongst the same people since uh, the end of the Civil War. No. What, what concessions or what signs have you seen that the, the rulers are willing to? You know, only, only for, the, for the audience, we were not part of the system since the end of the Civil War. We were uh, exiled, and we were always opponents to these policies that are still implemented. Now we came back trying to correct these policies, and we are not the majority, so we failed. Fine, we are paying the price now, but we are not at the source of this, we are not part of this, and that's why we are accepting now to go back to, to, to the opposition. Uh, but again, uh, the priority now is not to have a debate over, uh, over this. We, we have a failing or a failed system, a failed regime, but we don't want to have a failed state. Absolutely. That's, that's the main difference. Yeah. With that confessional regime that we have, the country will not be able to function. We want a secular, you know, a civil state, a secular system. We are advocating for this, but we don't have the majority to implement it. And this in a country, in a multi-confessional country like Lebanon, this needs a consensus. So we hope the only salvation for Lebanon is to have a civil state. We're not there yet, unfortunately, but we will fight for this first. We will fight against corruption, which is a cancer that is devastating the institutions of the state. And, you know, with corruption, equality and justice cannot, cannot prevail. We need equality in our society and justice to prevail. Allow me on the issue of corruption, because this is something um, that we've heard from you before. You, you came, uh, you campaigned on a promise to deliver reform, to fight anti-corruption, to fight uh, sectarianism. Transparency, Transparency International's Global Corruption Perceptions Index says this, Lebanon ranks 138th out of 180 countries when it comes to corruption. Corruption, it says, permeates all levels of society in Lebanon with political parties, parliament, and the police perceived as the most corrupt. So what concrete achievements can you point to yourself when it comes to fighting corruption that you've pledged to do? It is totally true, and that's why we are on the verge of collapsing, and that's why we are paying the price politically for this failure. What we are doing is that we already presented our bloc a series of laws, of anti-corruption uh, laws that can immediately put 
people under accountability and make them return the dilapidated money from the country. I hope that the political class, but most important that the peoples in the street would help us to put the needed pressure on the parliament to pass these laws. Because these laws, if they pass, we can right away put people under accountability. Uh, that's the problem that many Lebanese say, is that there, these discussions take place and there are a series of reforms that are uh, talked about and discussed, but they're not really passed. These laws are not passed. How, this how, is why how we can have you ensure an exceptional... That it's going to happen? Now, with the people rising, we have an exceptional opportunity to pass these laws. I, I believe this is the priority, because on a, on a political agenda, the Lebanese will disagree. What is uniting them this time is the need to fight the corruption and the need to have new policies and economy. We need to have a productive economy. Okay, this is what made our country, despite the richness in its private sector and its people and its natural resources, we are going bankrupt because of corruption. And this is what's uniting us despite our political and religious differ differences. Right. So we should seize that opportunities and uh, unite all together. And that's why we are sacrificing our seats in the government because we, we think that the unity of the people on anti-corruption is a golden opportunity that we should not miss. One more question before we turn to foreign policy, actually. Uh, on Lebanon specifically, uh, when you were Minister of Energy and Water, you promised the Lebanese 24 hours electricity by 2015. That deadline has not happened. It's passed, it's nearly five years later. Anyone that goes to Lebanon knows that there are severe electricity cuts no matter where in the country you are. So why have your promises failed to restore electricity? You know, actually, it's a shame for a country like Lebanon not to have electricity, but I was, modestly the first minister of energy who put a plan a whole plan not only f for electricity but f but for all the energy sector in lebanon and we passed it but because of corruption it was stopped because of corruption that plan stopped and the uh, power plants that were supposed to be built were not paid by the by the state, and so uh, the contractors didn't complete their work. Okay, um, and another factor driving the protest actually is frustration, as you know, with the sectarian system, which generates corruption, like you're talking about, and a gridlock, and people say it enables politicians to work for the benefit of their sects and their people, rather than the benefit of their country. Some protesters now are calling for a dismantling of the sectarian system. How, first of all, do you agree with that? And secondly, how do you begin to dismantle a sectarian system in a country like Lebanon where it's so deeply embedded? You know, I totally agree, but I have to admit that it's a long process because it's built on the education of the people. It's a cultural process. If people don't have it in their spirit, you know, you cannot have it on, on papers only. And I believe that we are still the minority asking for this, for this major change in a country like Lebanon. And this is, as I said, our salvation. Even it's the salvation of the Christians for whom I fight to get back their rights in the confessional system. I think this is the way to protect all confessions in Lebanon and to make people equal, citizens equal in front of law. Now we have the law of the powerful. We don't have the power of the law in our country, and this is what can make people really equal in front of, uh, of uh, the law. This is our salvation. Okay, let's turn to foreign policy and relations. We have a few minutes remaining. Uh, a former U.S. ambassador to Lebanon spelled out U.S. interests during a recent congressional testimony. He was saying this, that these protests fortunately coincide with U.S. interests against Hezbollah, and he urged stepped up American intervention, emphasizing the value of domestic initiative combined with external support. This is a quotation. What is your response to that? You know, I, I believe that it's not very wise if this is true. Not what he said, but if this is the policy. Right. You know, in order to... But we know what the to, U.S. policy is against Hezbollah, yeah, which yeah. is your ally. But, you know, it's to sanction a group of people you know, or a part of the population, you end up sanctioning all of the population and all of the country, you know, I don't think this is beneficial 
to the target one is aiming to. You know, this morning, uh, Dr. Mahathir said he is against the sanctions because I believe they put people and countries in isolation, where Lebanon can only live in interaction. You know, L Lebanon can bridge the differences. By nature, it is a country of equilibrium who can bridge between East and West, between Islam and Christianity, and isolating Lebanon or a group of Lebanese inside Lebanon is only a recipe for war or, or, or conflict. We need a positive competition in our region because, frankly, confrontation, not competition, confrontation can lead only to extremism in a region full of, you know, uh, fanatism. And this is leading to, to terrorism in the region, and this is not helpful. This is the anti-model of, of Lebanon. And this is killing uh, Lebanon. So we don't want to encourage, out of frustration, out of the unresolved Palestinian-Israeli crisis, we don't want to push people into more violence. This is not helpful. And this has proven not to be helpful. Look, look at Syria, look at Iraq. Do, do we want to turn Lebanon into another model like Syria and Iraq, or we want to put Lebanon on, on a path of prosperity, being a place, you know, for stability, for peace in the region, promoting peace, not promoting violence against each other, promoting coexistence. It is a, a, a region of diversity. I would promote the 11th, including Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Palestine, of full of diversity, not full of violence and immigration and, you know, uh, promoting the ideologies of hatred. This right. is not Lebanon. But some hold the view, a foreign minister, that Lebanon's relations with the international community and even with its regional uh, allies like Gulf countries have suffered. And that's due to Hezbollah's presence in Lebanon, as well as Hezbollah's alliance with Iran. So as foreign minister whose party is allied with uh, Hezbollah, uh, what do you say to that? You know, this is for internal matters, but our position for Lebanon is to be... This is not internal, this is the... This no, is I'm the saying our, our agreement, our understanding right. with Hezbollah is on inter internal issues and on, you know, uh, uh, protecting Lebanon against the aggressions from Israel. But, but as foreign but minister, let me tell you, you see it affecting your no, international relations? No, no, no. Let relations. me tell you, let me tell you, this has to be clear. Our positioning of Lebanon, we want it to be in good terms with all its friendly countries. We don't want Lebanon to be, to, to be put on an axis versus another axis. On, uh, on, in other terms, we are adopting the policy of disassociating Lebanon and keeping it away from the problems of the region, not bringing the problems of the region and the interventions of regional and international powers into the country. We cannot afford to have this. Lebanon is a, is a country who wants to, be, to have friendly relations with everybody. Uh, this is our nature. And we cannot, we cannot pay the price of the confrontations that are being uh, held regionally and internationally. These lines of confrontations crossing our country is something we cannot bear. Do you have a, 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 another line of confrontation possibly on the horizon with Israel? Because we know that Lebanon has a maritime dispute uh, with Israel extending along the edge of its southern energy blocks, particularly Block 9 is uh, contentious due to disputed waters. Um, so drilling for oil and gas, we understand, is set to begin uh, next year. Uh, but in the absence of any successful mediation, uh, what's at stake here for Lebanon? And, and do you see a confrontation on the horizon? You know, my position is clear on this. I have always been advocating on solving that issue through diplomacy and international laws. And that's why uh, I accepted the mediation made by the United States under the supervision of the United Nations to have an, an agreement on, on these borders, preserving the rights of each country. Uh, and I believe this can be an opportunity for more stability and prosperity in the region instead of being a source of conflict. Gas and oil in Lebanon should be a source of stability and peace not a source of another confrontation, if we respect the international laws. And this is the basis on which we build our foreign policy. And Lebanon, again, has never aggressed 
Israel. Lebanon was always under aggression from, from Israel, and we hope that on that issue, we can turn it positive. And uh, two more questions, and then we're done. The international community is promising aid. Uh, as you know, that is conditional on the formation of a new government in Lebanon. As foreign minister, what is your message to the, to the international community? You know, I believe every reform that is needed by the country shouldn't be conditioned, but by us, we should accept it because it is our need, it is our request. request. We accept any aid if it is not conditioned politically. Right. But when it is conditioned with reforms that we need, of which we are convinced, we have no problem. Finally, we need to put our country on the path of reforms. If this is pressured by our people through demonstrations and protesters, that's good, that's better. And if it's conditioned or pressure, if we are pressured by the international community to do needed reforms, no problem if this is helpful. But we don't want to impose on our country, you know, recipes that cannot succeed in our country or that can, you know, those uh, pre-prepared recipes that can work on other parts of the world and can be imposed on us. We want something that suits our economy, that suits our society, and, and, and why not to accept it? And just finally, on a personal note for a minister, um, before the protest erupted, some had been touting you as possibly Lebanon's next president. I don't know if you had heard that at all. But do you have presidential ambitions, or are you concerned about your future as a politician as a result of the uprising? You know, again, this is n not the moment for, this is not a priority. This has n never been a priority. I think that we have to save the republic better than thinking of the presidency of the republic. The republic by itself is in danger now. So uh, this is the priority now, and I think that we have uh, the mentality, the readiness, and the openness to save the republic. Uh, we are open to everybody. We, uh, we know what we should do. And we are aware that the people in Lebanon and us, we will unite very soon to have the struggle that never stopped for saving the country. It's, it's a country that is paying for the mistakes of everybody around us, you know? And we are paying a lot, but uh, I think Lebanon should be saved by, by its friends. And the first thing to do is to stop the external interventions in our country and not to allow the Lebanese to intervene in others' affairs. All right. Foreign Minister, thank you very much. Pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.